So I appreciate the opportunity to present. And uh, by way of basic introduction, I'm a town analyst and psychiatrist. And I've been in the field for over 35 years. And uh, devoted most of my life to the study of cultural psychiatry. Uh, in part from my own study and my academic interest, but also from my personal experience. And as I'll at finish of the presentation, you'll understand why. Uh, I'm also a proud representative, that, as I mentioned, I headed the American Alto Psychiatric Association, and which is in, uh, the nation's only interdisciplinary mental health work, uh, organization, as well as the American Association of Social Psychiatry. That makes me a proud representative of integrated psychiatry. Uh, most of us in the field embrace the biopsychosocial model that was promulgated by George Engel. But now we add culture. So now we call it the biopsychosocial cultural model. So let's talk about culture. And particularly I, uh, as it expresses itself in children and youth. The reason why culture and cultural psychiatry is extremely relevant is because what we're facing in this country is a major demographic shift. And by the year 2050, this will be a very different America than what you're used to. In fact, this is going to be a highly diverse America, no longer a Eurocentric nation. Um, it will no longer, there will no longer be a, popular, a majority population by the year 2042. There will, be, there, there will be no majority in the under 18 population by 2019. That's already the case for actually under eight year olds. This, this slide starts to get a little dated as you go along. Some of the most rapid changes are occurring in the most homogeneous areas. Uh, so I won't go into all, all those data, but the Southeast United States is seeing a major change, uh, the state of Pennsylvania as well, there's the growth of the Latino population and African American population and also immigrants, and New Jersey, which is already majority minority. Uh, but this will begin to happen all over this nation. It is happening all over this nation very rapidly. So as you can see, um, the, uh, the, the, the Euro origin population is shrinking. Um, the uh, Latino population is rapidly growing. The Asian population is rapidly growing. African American is somewhat. And the number of states where the U.S. Population, where the population uh, percentages of the population 20 or higher are foreign born, uh, essentially uh, have uh, the rim around the outer edges of the United States. You think of Boston as the Brahmin city. Let me just tell that notion. Boston is a highly diverse community. It is no longer the Brahmin. The Brahmin will have to move out of there at some point. Probably the back name. Huh. Because it is rapidly, it is a multicultural city already. It is a high percentage of Latinos, Asians, African Americans, and African origin people. Uh, this has major implications for psychiatry and mental health writ large because one of the major groups that uh, is a major mental health needs uh, are children and adolescents. Uh, they're not receiving the necessary services, their special needs culturally and linguistically uh, and developmentally are not being addressed. Not to say that there are great services for children of other cultural groups, but um, and particularly the mainstream population, but this is, a, this is the most rapidly growing segment of our society. The future of the United States hinges on this population. And we have a, a huge strength in being able to aid the development, but we will sink as a nation if we don't. Um, immigrant children uh, comprise already a large percentage of children and youth. Uh, over 30% of the U.S. school population, uh, most children of immigrants um, are American citizens and live in families where more, one or more children are citizens, but one or more parents are non-citizens. So this is, again, a rapidly moving target. Um, and already, we see that uh, in our classrooms and in our school districts. Uh, sadly, the school districts that are being most underserved are the ones that have the most diversity. Okay. Culture plays a particular role in human development. Uh, culture itself is the concept of, 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 of constructs that humans use to understand the greater universe. 
to understand the forces that impinge upon us, to understand our relationships, to understand uh, how we should uh, organize a society. Uh, and it incorporates basic beliefs, values, and explanatory models of everything that goes on around us. Uh, it influences various aspects of human behavior and development, including the, the base and foundation of identity, which is something that's been recognized now for some time, uh, unlike what many people would like to, to, uh, to realize. Uh, it, it, uh, culture underlies our, our definition of gender and relational roles, behavioral and emotional norms, approaches to child rearing and discipline, uh, our concepts of dependency and independence, both material and psychological, cognitive skills, uh, the ones that, that are valued by different, different uh, social groups and, and different cultural groups, uh, and even adaptive defenses and coping skills. And obviously, culture is largely transmitted by the family to the child, but also reinforced by the environment, reinforced by societal institutions. And most cultures have positive, protective cultural values that are inherent uh, in the culture. And I've just listed a few examples uh, amongst Latinos and Spanish. Now, to talk about Latinos as a homogeneous group is a huge mistake. There are many, many subject segments of Latinos. And um, I belong to one uh, small subject segment. Those are, uh, are Cubans, or Cuban origin people. But there are you know, actually the majority of Mexico, but also many other diverse Latino groups. But we do share some common protective uh, factors and in, in, uh, in values. Uh, Personalismo, which is social skills or value, familismo, which essentially uh, having the center of relationships being the family, even above nation. Uh, there's better respect for elders and community and authority, child centeredness, i.e., uh, sacrificing for one's children, uh, strong sense of community and active heritage, and spirituality, and also a certain set of taboos or uh, risky behaviors. Although, obviously, all these values are intersect with the values of the greater society and end up being modified as one goes through the process of acculturation, as we'll talk about in a minute. Um, however, we also know there are aspects of culture that are not only conceptual and psychological, but even are expressed uh, in, at, at the neural level. Uh, and that is the cutting edge uh, uh, area of research uh, that's called cultural neuropsychology. Um, for example, differential preferences of same race facial processing in three year olds, uh, di differential neural representations of very cog various cognitive functions that vary across cultures and also linguistic domains. Uh, one particular study that I, I, I uh, and, and actually has been replicated in a couple of locations is the mental representation of, uh, of uh, identity, self identity, and collectivist identity. Uh, in this one particular study, uh, children in China actually uh, were imaged as they thought about themselves and they thought about their mother. The same loci, loci in the brain actually uh, responded. Uh, for Euro-American children, different areas of the brain. So they thought about themselves, there was a, a certain segment of the cortex, and they thought about their mother, it was a, a different segment of the cortex. Chinese American children who were assimilated, their brains function like Euro American children. So there are two takeaways from that. One, uh, you actually can get a neural representation of what we call the collectivist cultural orientation. And by the way, that's not communism, as I have to explain to a colleague of mine. That's actually the idea that your, your identity is not your separate, your identity is part of a collective group. And many cultures actually own that as, 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 as a key cultural uh, value. It doesn't mean you lack agency as an individual, but, but uh, you don't think of yourself separately from the collective. Uh, this nation likes to indoctrinate people to individualism, but it is not the majority in the world. And unfortunately, it can be changed, or it can be you know, changed according to acculturation. Uh, Let's get this one here. Okay, so cultural identity is the part of the, of the individual self concept that derives from knowledge of membership in a social group of groups combined with the value and emotional significance that's attached to that membership. And all of this has a, a, 
we would know is sort of the gray mark of our of our individual identity that is associated to uh, to culture. Culture forms a significant part of that. Uh, it's a little different for minority populations because there's more awareness of not, not just being part of the group, there's awareness of the position that group holds in society, i.e., lower valence, uh, exposure to racism, exposure to discrimination, unequal societal distribution of power, uh, and inconsistencies in message and behavior to the majority culture that differ from the ones that you received in childhood. Uh, so, for children who are very young, um, they may understand some differences in our racial groups, they may misidentify their own color, they may begin, uh, uh, they may begin to have some greater awareness of, of racial and ethnic identity uh, if they're confronted by uh, or have to encounter diverse groups. Uh, at ages 7 or 8, they appreciate the permanence of ethnicity or race. By ages 8 to 10, they begin to uh, solidify some sense of uh, ethnic group identity, but also curiosity about other, other groups. But when you really develop an internalized identity, a cultural identity, it is in adolescence. And let's get these. Uh, and in adolescence, young people can go through various stages of cultural identity development. They start out with some degree of conformity, i.e. you're comfortable with the identity that you've uh, adopted or identified with for some time. You go through some dissonance, i.e. Uh, the experience in which inherent racism in the society begins to uh, break through your comfort and, and begin to see some of the differences in, in value systems. Uh, some res you go through resistance and immersion in which perhaps you uh, you, you reject the dominant society, you, re, you, re, you retrench uh, in, in your cultural identity of origin, but then maybe we'll move into introspection in which you uh, begin to uh, process understanding your own views versus those of others, and eventually integrative awareness, where uh, your inner sense of security and, and, uh, is, it grows and you have unique appreciations of your own culture of origin and other cultures and you pick the best from both. Uh, and Eric Erickson has to have a handle on this uh, in his work in uh, psychosocial development. He actually wrote, uh, wrote a textbook on uh, identity development. Uh, and in that textbook, he actually talked about how racial ethnic identity was an important aspect of psychological identity, how peer and family interactions were the mirror against those that, which had that identity developed. But then when you live in two worlds, and you actually studied this in American Indian children, you then dealt with that distance. The distance between what you, you had begun to identify with and what the greater uh, world reflected back to you. Uh, and then have to come to some form uh, of integration. Now, the optimal adaptation, as most researchers have uh, identified, is, is, is a state of biculturality. It's, that's the state of integration that uh, Atkinson uh, referred to, i.e., you have an identity that's rooted in your original ethnic racial group, but then you can navigate, you can actually function in different cultural contexts. Uh, however, there are other outcomes from the acculturation process. Uh, some, of them, and some of them may not necessarily lead to adverse mental health consequences, as some can. Uh, for example, assimilation over acculturation, we reject your your, your culture of origin completely. That may mean you may actually lose a part of your identity. That, that could actually lead to significant mental health consequences. Margination, when you separate from both cultures uh, and you have a certain sense of identity diffusion. Um, separation and modification, where you, where you actually reify in your culture of origin uh, and you're very bound then to the ethnic enclave. And there are people who operate that way. Even here in Philadelphia, they don't leave the neighborhood. They don't leave North Philly, they don't leave West Philly, they, uh, they, and, and they only interact with, with people from within the group, except maybe for work and tenuously at that. Uh, and then negative identification, which is an area that I think we need to study more. Uh, it is when you utterly reject other cultural orientations and the adolescent group together to develop their own. In some ways that's exemplified by gang warfare, and also I would propose by extremism. 
And so that's just the one we're facing internationally today. And this is just a pictorial that uh, shows those different um, points of cultural identification. That all doesn't occur in isolation. That happens in the context of the family. And as young people, as adolescents, are, go, are dealing with um, the acculturation process, being exposed to peers, being exposed to main, mainstream cultural institutions, their parents actually are, are looking to do this as well. And their parents don't adapt and don't navigate quite as easily. They actually tend to even hang on to their traditions uh, and their beliefs a little more fiercely, out of, out of discomfort, out of fear, sometimes out of fear of even losing their children. Uh, and as a result, then you have what is called a culture and family distancing, or an intergenerational uh, cultural conflict. Uh, and this is where the less acculturated, uh, very uh, defensive family clashes with the adolescent that assimilates very rapidly, adopts mainstream group norms, uh, challenges some of the traditional values, and ergo you have very significant conflict within the family. Uh, that has been a, a context in which a lot of psychopathology has been associated. Uh, in the 1980s, amongst Latinos, the Pastic and, uh, and Portis and Rubel identified higher risk for substance abuse and conduct disorder. In, in, the, in, the, in the late 2000s, Wang, who actually coined the term a culture of family distancing, found a strong association with depression and suicidality, both in Chinese origin and Latino origin, second generation youth. Uh, and of course, all this happens in the context of acculturation stress, in which you have pressures from us to assimilate from, from the mainstream culture, uh, conflicts between values, for example, achievement orientation versus family, families and loyalty, uh, loss of protective natural beliefs and values, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute, uh, changing gender roles, which can lead to marital, marital strain in the families, and even contribute to domestic violence, uh, and even generational change and expression of psychopathology, high risk of of, of more Western types of psychopathology as opposed to more traditional forms of distress expression. Um, and also the interplay with uh, some of the, um, uh, the stresses and traumas related to the immigration process itself, which the young people may have gone through uh, themselves or their parents may have gone through and is expressed in, in terms of vicarious traumatization. In the, in the studies around psychopathology, it's been fairly consistent that generation one immigrants and less, uh, 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 have lower rates of psychopathology and less acculturated uh, individuals tend to have a better mental health profile. And this is, it goes back even to the uh, ECA study, the epidemiological attachment area study of the, of the 1990s. It's been replicated by uh, a number of studies since then, actually, Mario Kendo, who's the uh, who right now is running for the APA presidency, uh, headed one of those studies. He'd be an excellent person for you all to consider having. Um, so it's led to a number of hypotheses about uh, immigration and acculturation in, in psychopathology. Um, you know, some people think, well, it's the, it's the resilient, hardy immigrants that from, that leave the country, and perhaps they're less prone to, uh, to mental health difficulties or maybe the repressed mental health needs while they're focused on um, you know, food, shelter, clothing, kind of the bottom rung of Maslow's pyramid. However, uh, and also that perhaps second generation people uh, may identify with some of the negative stereotypes that the mainstream culture has uh, uh, for uh, their particular groups. However, a new hypothesis actually does not negate any of those others, but it also adds the uh, internal conflict within the family uh, and also uh, in, uh, acculturation stress as being additional factors that perhaps place second generation youth at highest risk. And this is some ways one of the major challenges we face around uh, our diverse population. Uh, I myself have been involved in a number of studies that have, uh, have looked at this, and I'll uh, share with you the data on one uh, in a minute. Uh, but again, these have been uh, gone on through the 1990s and, and, and through the 2000s. Uh, one of the classic ones, the A at all, to 2003, in 319 Japanese, Chinese, and Korean immigrant youth, they found age acculturation and cultural adjustment difficulties significantly predicted mental health symptoms. But that is the theme running throughout all these studies. 
This is one from some of my work uh, back in the 1990s along the U.S.-Mexico border, and where we looked at suicidality uh, in, uh, in the past week, uh, a, a sample of 4,000 youth, 2,000 on the Mexican side, 2,000 on the American side, who were 90% Mexican-American. And as you see, the, the greater exposure you have to mainstream American culture, um, and you go from two uh, Mexican-born to two Mexican-born parents, all the way to U.S.-born Mexican-American with two U.S. Two US born Mexican-American parents, the higher the rate of suicidality. Suicidality in the uh, Mexican-American population is three times higher than in the Mexican-born population. And, so, and also so with substance abuse. Uh, and there have been more recent studies, um, uh, I'll, I'll just like one of those, I know, I'm going out, uh, looked at 347 uh, Latino early teens, they looked, and they found that self-esteem was more consistently a predictor of risk and extent of substance abuse, and that they got the deadly correlation correlated to substance abuse risk and acculturative stress. Self-esteem mediated the relationship, but certainly acculturative stress is a major factor. But you can also see similar findings around depression, uh, and even in suicidality. In some ways, there has been a bit of a backlash amongst diverse populations to the concept of assimilation as a result, perhaps, of some of these uh, experiences. Uh, and as you know, the traditional model for America uh, around identity has been the melting pot. We're all supposed to be melted into this homogeneous post American culture. Uh, and become good Americans and forget who we were. And in Alice Island, they actually took names away from people and gave them Anglicized names. Uh, yeah, I would say somewhat of a travesty. Not, no, not obviously not worse than a travesty committed without uh, African slave ships. But the newer generation of immigrants are rejecting the melting pot. Uh, a <coughs> survey by the Democracy USA and the Pew Foundation found two thirds of, of of Latino youth wanted to retain their culture of origin and their identification. They did not want to identify themselves as purely American, at least as hyphenated Americans. Um, and that also is, I think, creating some conflict with the mainstream culture. Because obviously, we have the generation of people who uphold the melting pot and they wonder why these people don't want to join us. <laughs> then why are they here in the first place? But then the young people are, are voting the other way and saying, uh, perhaps losing our identity is not worth uh, doing, and there's no reason why we should have to lose it. Um, so I want to tell a little bit of where my interest in this comes from, which is my own story. I myself am, am a 1.5. That means I was born in the home country and raised in the United States. Uh, and I came when I was nine. Uh, very happily with my family because I could have come with only one parent or no parent. Uh, and I came just before the missile crisis, so of course that makes me a Cold War baby. Uh, my parents are very provincial in their outlook, very unassimilated, they didn't even know English before they came. Uh, the, when they came to the United States, it was the first time they had ever left their hometown, a provincial capital in Cuba. Uh, they faced many acculturation stresses. Uh, although somewhat buffered by a growing ethnic enclave in Miami, which I'm sure you all have heard about. Uh, and that one actually has evolved. It's no longer primarily Cuban. It's actually more multi-Latino. Uh, so I was raised within the family business. We restarted the family business. Um, and you know, kind of uh, working away from the ground up. Uh, and it became kind of the focus of rebuilding security and retaining heritage. So you can say that was conformity. When I'm growing up, within a traditional Cuban pharmacy, uh, trying, uh, retaining some of the, the, uh, the values and traditions uh, of the culture. But then, obviously, as I progressed in my adolescence, I began to branch out a little bit in, in, in dealing with people from other backgrounds. So there began distance. Uh, I went through some degree of acculturated family distancing uh, through my adolescence and maybe went it well into my 20s. And uh, there were significant cultural loyalty issues, particularly around my choice of uh, my, my choice of a spouse. Uh, and I, uh, I, I, I fell in love and uh, eventually married an Italian American girl. Very similar culture, but not my own. And I, that was seen as uh, problematic by my family, along with also my choice of career. You know, what's this child psychiatry stuff? 
so that's middle dissonance and to some extent introspection. Uh, that, though, propelled me to depart from the ethnic conflict and began to expose then even broader cultural influences, also the discrimination, which I had never faced in Miami, uh, and, 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 and even some, some pressure through origination. There was a time, to be honest with you, that I felt I needed to change my last name so I could get published in the scientific literature. Now I'm proud to say that people come to me to publish with me because of the name, which is nice. It's a nice turnaround. Uh, so that, but that was later in, uh, in dissonance uh, and introspective uh, in stages of, uh, of, of development. And then, but eventually, with mentorship, spouse support, my, my second, my, my 2.5 children uh, being born and, and working on them, on, uh, with them on their identity, uh, actually I, I came to have more integrated awareness. So uh, I, you know, I, I, I see myself as, as, a, as a hyphenated Cuban American, uh, retaining some of my values and beliefs, but also um, championing uh, an integrative approach to looking at culture writ large. Thank you. relatively new, year old, practice parameter for cultural competence in China and Western psychiatry. Uh, I chair the Committee on Diversity and Culture of the Academy of Child Psychiatry, and a subgroup of our group actually worked together on putting the first practice parameter in all medicine that addresses culture. This is as recognized by the Institute of Medicine. Uh, that's the October 2013 issue of the Journal of the American Academy of China and Western Psychiatry. It's pretty self-explanatory. Also, uh, there's a, an issue of um, at the time of less than country place in North America, uh, on, on culture of pediatric mental health. Uh, and uh, I, I co edited that with Shoshana Yoshi from Stanford, a uh, very a strong colleague of mine. Uh, he, he's a, he's a, uh, a Gen 2, uh, ultra cool millennial who uh, actually uh, of, uh, of Indian origin but also uh, experiments in Latino culture. So. We, uh, we're, we, we actually uh, greet each other in Spanish, which is incredibly, uh, incredibly nice. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, he, so that, that, that has a raft of, of, of papers that might be helpful.